there we go good morning everybody and welcome to the fourth edition of AMA <laughs> good to see you all hey Miguel is here and Diver hello and uh, Michelle hello everybody good to see you guys good to see you thank you for tuning in um, today we're going to talk about um, look design or you know our plugin the look designer but also like the same plugin works inside the uh, color lab as well so i will be basically showing you in both and what's really interesting now with an xo one support we can move our work between the two applications and so on so you'll see like you know sometimes if you feel like oh, i wish i had a, like a better user interface now you can actually you can you know design everything beautifully inside uh, color lab ai and then move it um and to the you know Da Vinci or even Adobe Premiere so basically like you know the, the workflow is just getting better and better but I'm really going to focus and to show you also like a you know how you can build looks how a looks meant to be built um, and then also how to test them this is also very very important so basically this is what's going on uh, okay you say guys that audio is not syncing i don't know like it looks like all i can do at the moment is 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 like a, like this uh all right all right so <laughs> diver uh okay seems to be working fine all right so um before i start i just really wanted to also guys let you know that um uh, next Saturday, um, we are uh, going to have a really special training um, that I highly recommend to anybody who is interested in, you know, getting better in the game of color grading. If you're working professionally, especially, this is really important for you. Um, basically, in the mighty Walter Volpato is going to do a training that you know we haven't ever done before. It's it's a first time that we're ever going to do this type of training. So, so what he's going to do is he's basically going to grade a whole project live in, and we're going to be watching. And the best thing is like, we're going to have the same media as he's having. So we're going to be able then to, you know, work with him and, and, and also, you know, later, you know, play the, the, the recording of how he's grading and, and redo things and then grade it like that and then post uh, our own results and share and so on so it's going to be basically really a select group of colorists that is going to you know be able to attend it live and watch it's a really really interesting i have to say that this is probably you know one way i think you know I, at least in the past i used to learn the most by sitting and watching other colorists work now especially having somebody you know like Walter, you know, to do it, I think it's going to be really educational for all of us. So, you know, I can't recommend it enough. Just head over to Color the Training website and and see, um, you know, how to register yourself. Uh, okay, so let's see what we got uh, coming. Let's go and we're going to start with the look designer. Um, I want to just first, you know, give you a little bit of explanation, really what's uh, happening um, uh, with uh, with basically with with it. So let me show you, like, uh, just for first, you know, what I call the signal flow, right? And then we'll see. All right. So, so what's gonna uh, the way how it works is this. So, Look Designer actually has a complete color management in place. Okay. So this is how it works. Sorry, I'm trying to open my my pen. All right. So the first thing we got is input, right? So this is where, you know, the signal comes in and this is where things get color managed. You know, so there is option for more than 40 cameras or something like that, you know, that we can do. And then here we have an output and um, this is where you can output to almost any color space, HDR display, but also scene color spaces, right? And what's really cool about this in and out is that that means that your look is always done in, ideal color space for look development right so you're always building your look in in, in best possible space um, what we have as well is something first that happens which is called um, gamut limit okay gl i'm gonna call it so this is for situations when we have a led lights or you know some sources 
um, of, of light that have a very bright and saturated colors and then you know we can limit a little bit their gamut and so reduce the possibility of an error. The next thing then that we have is we have a like a pretty standard uh, lift gamma gain controls like what you normally see in any color grading system so lift gamma gain you know this is, is there so you can also do it but what's really interesting about this one it also has a printer lights and these printer lights work in uh, stops so you can actually really know exactly how many stops you're going to be able to change stuff right so the next thing then that happens then is where we convert things into subtractive color space okay so we move then everything into into sub and this is where many people like uh, you know you know think oh yes it's it's a cyan magenta <laughs> and yellow and that's not <laughs> it's just what subtract subtractive color is like a really you have to understand that subtractive color is subtractive because there is actually three emulsion layers okay and what's very specific about these three layers is that the light goes through all three of them, right? So, um, and then it, with the increased density, um, the colors get a little bit darker, right? But the saturation goes up. So this is very, very specific for, for um, you know, film and, and, and that behavior is, is, is more what we're trying to emulate than just, you know, to give you controls that are uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow controls, because that's not really, you know, what, what this is all about, okay? After then subtractive, um, we all then have a one, de uh, like a density controller, okay? So this density controller is there to correct, you know, uh, what you normally lose in terms of the light, okay? So that's coming next. And then what, gets, what happens then is then we have basically... Um, a, a negative control. Okay, so the negative control, the idea of a negative control really comes, you know, from cinematographers with whom I worked a lot and who explained to me that what they used to do is they used to basically, you know, want to develop a look, you know, they used to shoot, you know, different negatives that they would have and then used to process them. So we have exactly the same idea. So this is what gives you a character to your image. Not as much probably as the, as the next control, which is the print control, but this is really where you can actually start building your palettes effectively, right? By choosing the right negative. Okay, then what happens then is, is then we have a print control. Okay, now this is probably the most... Um, kind of you know a, a visible you know change that you're ever going to have in your look because the printing process is really where you are you know com you know where you're influencing a lot your image now you know you have option to do a completely clean print or you can have an option to do printing on some older film stock now there is a list of for example different film stocks you know like um you know but reason why we have a you know same stock in, in various other options is because different um, facilities and different laboratories would get different results by printing at the same stock so you can take actually same piece of you know film and give it to different laboratories to process and they would give you different results. So we're actually really playing with that idea. We're saying like, okay, look, you know, you know, let's see how, you know, what would, and, and, and there isn't a really right or wrong here. You're really just trying to build a look and you're trying to see, hey, which one is really gonna work for me? What's really gonna, you know, be the, 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 the give me the idea that I want. Now, very important part of this printing process is a contrast curve and I would say that you know this this you know this contrast curve you know like is incredibly important now we have separated it from the print okay but it's actually like you know part of the same process and this contrast curve is really what gives you the most character okay and this contrast curve is very difficult to design just by using you know curves inside da vinci because they are very fine you know these 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 curves are 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 you know the, the the way how they behave is just very very specific sometimes for film stock sometimes you know for for you know transfer curves and so on so so like a, there this is a collection of interesting curves that you have and that you can also control their intensity and so quickly then decide what you do and then we have a, now a new control as well which is part of the contrast 
okay, which is called crunch. Okay, so crunch is a process. What is crunch is basically when you when you when you uh, printing film, there is a little air gap, and this air gap, you know, creates that means that there is a little bit dispersion of light, and because of that, you know, we get like a little bit, you know stronger shadow and a little bit like you know gloomier highlight you know so that's very you know interesting and it it's not it's it's not curve it doesn't you know behave linearly crunch content of your of your of your shot right then what we do then is we, then we do post process okay now what is post process so basically you have two options at the moment so one option is to um basically um, do like a bleach bypass, you know, which we call ENR, or um, you can actually just use a limitation, like uh, you know, you know, like a for film print emulation, it's called FPE, where you actually say, "Hey, I really want to get my result to be 100% accurate to what normally film printing gamut is giving me." So then you're switching this FPE because you know all of this so far, everything we see is basically can can happen in a much um, bigger color space, you know, you can really expand it beyond what the original film was giving us, right? Um, and then we have then possibility, we have in like a, some called a master controller, where we can decide, you know, how much of all of that look we really want, you know, how intense we want everything to be. I mean, all of these elements we've seen so far, we can control precisely each one of them. But if you want to just have like a control over everything, Right. This is then what you can uh, what you can dis you know control with a, with the final master. You know, so this is a, you know just a quickly an overview to you know what and how um, you know really things are are set in, in terms of the image processing. Right. Uh, now I want to just uh, show you now basically how that works inside the let's say i'm now inside the look designer you know so you know i can basically just show you that so look i'm just going to go into look design and uh, um so first of all you know i mentioned days of this there is this thing called gamut limit right so you can find it here on the input right and then you go to look design here and then this is where you have negatives right then you have your prints here like we said then here are the contrast curves. Then here is the crunch. Now here is the subtractive controller. Now here is the post processor. You also have a saturation and temperature. And that initial lift gamma gain is available to you here in primary. And the way why it's designed like this is to allow you to really pin on a particular color. Very often when we're designing a look, we say, ah, oh, I wish it would have a little bit more, let's say, red or yellow. You know? So then you have actually really ability to tune in just that particular color. Um, and Or you can, you know, work overall, you know, the image and contrast and so on. So now the same thing basically exists now also as a plugin. So if I, for example, go now inside DaVinci Resolve, and then I'm going to go and say, okay, give me now my look designer. And I put the look designer now onto my clip. Okay, I'm gonna get exactly the you know same options, but they're just you know limited to what you know you get as a controls inside the No Effects plugin. So here is your you know input and output. You know, in my case, because I'm working here with a Panasonic footage, then I have different options for my um, 709 output or any other you know color spaces that I mentioned like you know everything like we had there um, then here is the gamut limit right then the, then we have uh, the printer lights which is you know basically like part of this kind of um, primary then lift gamma gain and then you come to subtractive color right then you have a push and pull which is the density controller then you have the temperature right as well then you have a saturation here as well so all of that happens like you know in an in, 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 in so-called an input stage then you have your negatives here then we have here our prints right and then here is the the crunch as well and then we have a post processor you know ENR and so on and then we're going to come then to these test images and I'm going to explain to you a little bit how they work okay so 
all the control all this you know controls are here they are you know available to both i'm going to use you know uh, um, the look designer inside um color lab because i just really like you know like these controls like a little bit more you know and now especially that i can design it here and then move an x01 into my um into my you know da vinci is a really you know workflow that i tend to actually use at the moment okay so my beginning if i was now to go and design a look right my beginning is always a contrast curve and um, the reason why is because these contrast curves they really you know have a big um, effect on an image and i always compare this to let's say if i was be to be a music composer the first thing i would do is i would decide to what tempo of the song that i'm going to compose i will have so what's the tempo and i'm going to say okay fine you know one of these contrast curves is going to give me like that kind of character that i'm going for right you know so you basically are, are, are you know in, and this is so easy like i really love it that i can just quickly cycle through them right and then find the one that really feels like it's giving me the the the, the, the desired result you see how f f5 is giving me like a more dreamier highlight but let's say for example this k0 it's kodak i'm gonna go for that right so there we go um now I'm going to start this is my contrast now what's really cool is well you can then decide how much intensity of that contrast curve you want so you see you can basically move it and say and you know so you can crunch it or make it as strong or as little as i want but like like say this is good i also then dial in a little bit of crunch now i have to tell you be careful with the crunch don't overdo it you know i'm just going to kind of do it a little bit like this but you see you know it just really gives that little bite sometimes that we need you know I, okay let me just make a much more so you see actually really how, how it works when it's a lot you see how it basically gives you like a you know like a you know it, it almost increases makes image appear a little sharper but it's not really doing any of that it's just you know adding you know this kind of little bite i like it it's a, such a you know useful trick that it's impossible to create with curves or anything like that um okay so there we go so now i'm i'm in this kind of you know ballpark i'm going like okay in in you know, i have a good contrast curve now i'm deciding on a tonality okay so you know so first we got like a, you know construct you know my black and white image first right so like you know now let's let's do the tonality the tonality i will start working with my subtractive because you know so basically and you always move it in the direction of right you never work negative you know subtractive you actually always work positive subtractive right so you adding a little bit the value and the idea is that you push those values and then you try to create a dissonance and that little blend because they all affect each other you see i'm moving cyan but it's actually affecting magenta and yellow at the same time because light goes through all three of them so they all affect one another okay you cannot really say oh one's you know completely independent of another they all really you know affect each other right so i'm going to go and just get to some sort of tonality that i'm looking for look so like you know when i'm kind of push this yellow i really maybe like that you know so it it it, it really kind of you know you probably have in your mind you know an idea to what color you'd like to have and you know somehow i feel like okay this is this could be it you know this is my kind of you know tonality so you can always switch it on and off just to see oh god you know it's unbelievable i actually really don't know why is it so easy to get such a beautiful <laughs> color balance with a subtractive but it works so i'm not gonna over analyze it you know and 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 i and and that's kind of the really the thing that i do a lot is like i always build my look somehow in a subtractive and and then with that i i i, I kind of you know and I'll give an uh, overall tone of to my image, right? So you see where I am now here, like look, right? It's great. Um, you can also also compare. This is your standard seven and nine, and this is your basically without anything. So it's looking really good. Here I have to just be careful. There's like a little highlight is very strong. This is where the crunch, you know, needs to work. All right. So now I'm ready um to maybe you know what i'm because i'm going for this warmer look i'm, I'm gonna add a little bit temperature this is like a, something that's normal for film when you emulate film you should always like actually move this dial a little bit for about 500 kelvin or 200 kelvin what i'm doing at the moment because you 
you always you know in film you know we always used actually d60 light not this d65 so it is actually you know just that little change alone is just you know like important if you if you want to like move a little bit into this territory of the more natural looking you know white balance right like this okay great so now i'm there cool next thing then that i need to do is i need to decide on a film stock Okay, now let me just show you what there. There are several options of, of you know these different film stocks, right? So I have a standard you know film stocks that are like a literally sampled from you know various. Oh my God, this is looking so good actually, from various um, um, you know films. This is an Ektachrome. Ah, reversal. That's why. Of God, yeah. This is why it's a reversal stock. But also, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to it. I really like it the way it looks, but I want to just show you a few other options. Now, major, it's also coming back from music, you know, and, and you know, major is always good for like, a, you know, more of a positive kind of outcome or something like that, right? Um, this, this is really like a, a stock, you know, a, a look, you know, or color palette that is, you know, you know usually used for some sort of you know stories that you know have to have you know more of a kind of you know uplifting or more more positive vibe right but then you can also go for minors and as you can see straight away you see minors like a more like going like oh, something a little bit you know is going a little wrong you know you know maybe a story that is you know more like a negative more horror more something like that and you know every every story has got you know it's oh look there isn't really one right or wrong then you have a phototune they come they're inspired really with the well, from this you know this kind of you know uh fuji street photography right you know i i'm a big fan of you know those little fuji cameras um, and, um, you know, they have some kind of recipes, they call them, and this is really inspired by those recipes. This is nothing really too complicated, you know, they, they, they are, they are, you know, they just, you know, I took some of those recipes and emulated them um, as, a, you know, XY profiles for you, and they are just available here. So, you know, you can, you have those. Then you have, uh, you know, the Cinetones. The Cinetones are, are basically... Um, they are um, looks that, you know, are usually, you know, kind of, you know, deployed by, I would say, like a Hollywood colorist. Let's call it like that, right? So really, like, you know, if, if we kind of take, like, a, you know, analyze a lot of films, and this is what we were doing when we were training our AI model, right? We were able to actually, you know, see that there is some sort of, you know, ty uh, 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 type of looks or design of looks or design of palettes um, that is prevailing in many films. It's kind of if you if you basically, you know, start training, you know, an AI and 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 you feed it, you know, with the just the random images from many movies, you slowly start realizing, you know, that 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 there are certain palettes that are present in 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 movies that you know keep you know appearing over and over in different films again and this is not an, not a, like a, an accident there is a certain aesthetic that we combine with when we say oh something looks filmic right there's aesthetic there so these cine style profiles are exactly that so they're not really like you, you would say oh they look filmic they're not really you know, originate from any film stock but they are just simply, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, analysis of different films, you know, and 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 so basically, you know, have built these kind of looks. Um, then, um, and this is really like, you know, what what you know you you can you know choose from these. I'm gonna go back to my kind of you know film, and then I'm gonna go here and choose the Ektachrome because I really like that. Okay, then what you can do, you can decide how intense you want this, right? And I remember I showed this, you know, to Beverly Wood, you know, she's a, like a, she used to run laboratory uh, for Deluxe in Hollywood for years, and she was responsible for some most amazing, you know, looks, like, for example, Movie 7, you know, she was the person who actually, you know, 
processed that you know bleach bypass look or, or skip bleach i think they call it and you know and she always said oh my god you know we used to mix the chemicals and all you guys need to do is just move a dial <laughs> And it's really true. It's true. Like, you know, you actually can, can just, you know, you can just put a negative and you can decide how much or how little of it do you want. And these controls, especially, I really like, they're very precise and you can really, you know, move them. And so you see, this is the look that you just get from the negative. You see how it, how it kind of, you know, what I really like about this as well is that it doesn't really affect the contrast. And this is very specific about, you know, the look designer engine that's, that, that processes color separate from the contrast from the luminance so you know gives you with that a cleaner result and also like you know and and also creatively you're able to you know control it just a little bit better like that you know you are really able to separate hey i'm not i only want to see what's really happening with my color and that's and that's a kind of you know really important when you start building looks right because you want you know to know exactly what what is happening in this moment you know what what you're building i always hated that when i kind of you know take look up tables or some film emulations they kind of change my whole look right suddenly I, the exposure changes everything changes and i only want to like you know just use some of the tonality so you have that here now and then the final decision is let's print it okay now you know the prints you have this kind of first is Gen 1. This is, um, you know, also a, a generic. So what we did is we basically said, okay, what is mathematically expected, you know, this to look like, you know, and this is the Gen, Gen 1 print. It's not really, um, you know, like a, an actual film print. It's, it's, it's been, you know, calculated by myself in a lab to what this value is going to be. But actually, you know, because of that, it's technically, it's perfect. Now, also, what I'm talking about is different film stocks and all of this. What you have to understand is this. Sometimes you'll find that some film profiles don't look very clean. And that's really true. Technically, film you know, profiles have, you know, very strange behaviors in terms of color. And, you know, sometimes when people tell me, oh, give me like a film emulation, I know that actually they don't really want a perfectly accurate film emulation. They want that look of a film emulation. So you have to be like a, you know, expect, you know, realistic about it. You know, some film profiles are technically going to show some errors. You'll see now when we do the analysis, you know, later on, you'll see how some of them are just, you know, basically, you know, have, you know, very weird, you know, curves. And, and that's what film looked like that's how it behaved you know it's nothing really unusual um you know and and we have you know really like a collected here like a stuff you know from laboratories you know from japan you know from new york from hollywood from london like different places that i you know through my years you know of, of work i was able you know to get access to and you know sometimes i would profile a film um, you know, for our own calibration and kept that profiling data and so on. Sometimes they would give me their profiling as well. So there is a real, like, you know, collection here. Uh, and they are like, you know, all the different, you know. So, so you see, like, when I say like a 2383 classic, this, what it means is really these are different types of, of, of film prints from different laboratories, right? And, and you know, there isn't a really anyone that's, right or wrong you know some people have been you know making you know these things look one way or another and you just have to choose which one works best for you though an interesting one is this mpf mpf stands for motion picture film and this is kodak's um, target values that they use uh, digital values so what that they use in order to design the actual film and then once they you know produce the film they compare the um, you know the pro produced you know film to this particular profile and then so are trying to establish whether you know the you know manufactured film is according to the specification so mpf is is not really a, a, an actual film this is you know what we are hoping to create you know when we produce film so it's a really actually <laughs> interesting you know for us you know to actually load that and understand oh so you know it's it's a very clean version of of i would say um 
you know, Kodak film print. Gen 2 um, is uh, is wonderful. Like, you know, Gen 2 gives you like a, this 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 um, very rich, very rich colors. Um, you know, the gamut is just insane, you know. So you have like, a, you know, different, you know, film prints for in a, on Gen 2 as well. So uh, I, I'm going to go and choose the Gen 2 2393, which is, you know, a stock that, you know, we probably as a filmmakers would have never been able to afford. Um, but, you know, hey, why not? Let's go and pretend it. And so you see what I did now is I build a look, you know, that is just, you know, wonderful, like, you know, strong, you know, colorful, right? And I say, okay, so now this is my look. Now, what I also can do is I can say, well, I want to just, you know, like maybe control a little bit now um, my overall output. So I'm going to go in post-processing, select FPE, that stands for Film Print Emulation. And then with that, I can then just go and choose how much of that limit I want. Basically, what FPE really does, you'll see, like, it just really controls that the overall volume, you see, like, you know, overall volume of the color is being more limited to the, you know, actual, you know, realistic physical properties of the film. And, um, and, 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 you know, because you have to understand the input that we are getting, you know, is much wider gamut than what we were actually capturing on, on film negative, what film negative was able to capture. So because of that, our output can also be much higher than what film was able to produce. And then if we say, no, no, I want to be really be more realistic as if I had been capturing on film, then this is why you would want to switch this FPE here and just, you know, control it a little bit, right? Okay, and then you have also this primary and you say, mm, I wish, for example, if I could just have in my shadow a little bit teal. So what you do then is then you say like my lift, then you click on lift. So the lift is on and then you come to my cyan here and then you just basically push a little bit, you know, cyan in your shadow, right? And you see if I was to do it, you see it's basically what it's doing is like a doing a primary of of that you know so oh i can then control that a little bit like this right so you have also control you know a fine you know tune control of particular color available to you as well okay great so now this is my you know kind of look designed right I, i'm kind of happy with it right let's see i love it so what i do now is that then i right mouse click onto this and i say hey export as an xo one then I come to my, let's say I'm going to put it onto my desktop and I'm going to say, all right, so let's leave this name, look designer, whatever it is. And then you go into your DaVinci. Okay. And in DaVinci, you come, you know, to the shot that was the shot that I was doing earlier. And then I'm just going to go and put the look designer here. And then I'm going to here say import my X01, right? And then I can just get it from my desktop. Okay, here we go. And all those controls are now fully available here as well. And I have that look basically perfectly translated in my, you know, in my DaVinci Resolve. So, but I have all the controls here. So I'm still able to fully, like, you know, uh, you know, so to take them and work with them further. I can then further refine it. I'm not like, I didn't export a lot that is locking me in. I'm actually like, you know, have all the parametric values of that look available to me as well. And that's a real, you know, beauty that, you know, we're not just moving look a lot around. We're moving actual preset, actual language or actual, you know, parameters that we have used to make that look. And, um, and, and, and that way, you know, like we're, we, we can continue refining it if we feel like it, you know, and, and, I, and I really, really like that concept, you know, that, that we don't really, you know, that we don't really limit ourselves to, to, you know, oh, now I'll have a lot and I'm baked, I'm done. No, actually, I can, I can completely actually continue working with this. Um, and then now I can continue degrading all the other shots, right? and then putting them into place as you can see like everything kind of falls into place nicely because you know we're working like in a scene referred way so you know the lat's not falling apart because it's actually not a lat it's an actual image processing pipeline right 
and so I'm able to very quickly go and apply this to everything else. I can then use it as a scene referred look. I could, for example, in most of the cases, what you see me do is I would actually go and say to this, look, well, don't be actually output to 709. I don't want this. I want you to output it to, uh, let's say, um, array log C, right? And then I would then put here in my output transform my in a, in a whole timeline I would then go back to the display so that way I can stay fully seen referred inside my grading panel which is another lesson I'm going to talk about you know the advantage of working scene referred you know um, in 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 another you know lesson that's not really time for it to talk about it now so okay so let's say we got it we're kind of you know in a situation where we like feel like happy you know with with you know what we did but now what's important for us is to test and to see hey is this look going to you know what we say hold the water right is this going to be really you know able to sustain everything you know now in these test shots it looks okay but you know we're going to be using it on the, on the whole project we need to know really what's happening with it and i'm going to show you first how i can do this inside um color lab ai but you know the principle also works as a plugin they, they share the same code so here on the right hand side you have these three test um, buttons okay so let me show you the first one is uh, basically what we call your tonal mapping curve okay so what you see here is a mid gray okay so this is your mid gray here you you see um, you know a, a, a gray tone map you know from black to white and here you have 12 stops of log C. So what you can then see now here, and I don't know how well guys, you, oh yeah, it's better now, I, I know, you can basically see what's really happening with it. So I can tell that that my my, my show lot has a very strong, um, you know, color shift, because you see like, you know, that, that you know, my, my red and blue are not sitting on neutral gray, so they have moved around. So that means that, you know, this look by itself, by the, by the nature, is not going to, you know, be a, a, a neutral, neutral kind of, you know, basically, it, it is always going to give me, uh, you know, uh, in this case, some warmth, right, because the cold tones are lower than, and, but you know, what's really cool is that the green still sits exactly on 400. You can, if you want, you know, use now your primary, for example, to create a neutral version of that look as well. So you could, for example, go and say, okay, I'm just going to go and take a little bit my blue up, right, like this. Okay. And then I'm going to, and that pretty much brings it all back into the balance, right? So I'm able to kind of just, you know, adjust it like with a little bit of my blue like this I'm bringing my neutral gray to sit exactly on 400 so this is the beginning what's really important when you're doing a lot look is that it doesn't it doesn't unless you really want it it doesn't change the exposure show lot needs to stay neutral because if cinematographer is calculating light using a light meter then monitor needs to display an accurate exposure as well. You can't really build a show lot that is going to make an image be darker or brighter on the monitor, right? So, so cinematographer needs to have this control that whatever they measure is it's whatever that's what they get. And if you kind of are whacking your show lot so around that the mid gray is all over the place, like it's too high or it's too low, then you know you're basically you know disturbing that so it's important that you always are making sure your show that is not changing the actual exposure unless you want this there are sometimes situations where we deliberately bring with the show like the whole exposure down and the reason why we do that is because we want to um, with that allow cinematographer to overexpose on camera a little bit so that we get less noise you know this is something we regularly do with with cameras like red you know that we just always like you know bring down you know the exposure and the way how to do it is that you go into printer lights and then in printer lights you can then just bring it down for eight points and that's going to be a full stop 
So now, for example, this is a show let that is going to give a stop less on the monitor, for example. Okay, so that's a that's a one option. All right. The second thing that that you're looking on a tone mapping curve is that you don't have anything, uh, you know, when I say stupid going on, right? That you haven't got any 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 like you know strange you know, uh, things happening. So this is a beautiful S here, and this is a nice S on top. If you really want to see it in a fully linear fashion, what you do is you go here and you say, hey, give me Ari log C as an output, and then you're going to basically see log C to log C, and then it's a little bit easier to read the curve and to see what's happening. This kind of you know, stuff where curve gets a little bit funny in the highlight, this is typical for film print emulation. They have, you know, some sort of, especially in the highlights, you know, some sort of, you know, strange behaviors. Now, if you don't like this, then use a generic type of film print, you know, like, you know, the, 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 anything, you know, that's not the real film, but, you know, is the emulation of film, and then this is going to clean you up. If you feel like, oh, no, I really want to be like technically kind of rounded off or something like that, then yes, go ahead and just, you, you will first, you know, weigh how you're going to fix these, any of these kind of little kind of bumpy lines is, is by using those stocks. All right, the next thing then is, is uh, here is the lightness curve. Okay, so what is that? So what you do here is, is um, no, sorry, this is the saturation curve and this is the lightness curve. So let's go over the saturation curve first. What we have here is every pixel. So think about it. Every pixel is giving you a potential RGB value and the whole spectrum of RGB values is presented in this particular screen. And what we are changing is we are changing saturation for that particular color. Okay, so for example, here, right, is a cyan, and here you have basically the full, you know, uh, you know, clean cyan, the most, you know, and then here you have completely desaturated cyan at the bottom, right? And then there is a, the change is going from desaturated to saturated. What you're really looking here is to see what is happening with your what is happening with your saturation. What's happening? Where you know because LUT is always going to limit some color. That's what really LUT does. You know, it takes an input and, and you know and kind of you know you know wraps it around its its profile. And um, and basically. By, by, you know, analyzing it with this, you can then read and see what's happening with it. So look, look, if you say, okay, this is my, you know, generic output, this is nothing happened. And then this is my output post slot. You can see straight away what's going on. So there is big um, reduction in uh, saturation of green color. You see how basically I'm, I'm, I'm completely moving actually also that green um, more into the yellow. Okay, so that's a kind of number one thing. This is this is, by the way, very you know common if you start working with subtractive. You know that you have this kind of beautiful shifts of hue that are not like a matrixy hue or something like that. This is just you know what blend of two layers really does it for you, right? And then we can see that here also very strong saturated blues have become more teal, right? So there, and you can also read it here. Look. You see how there is actually no blue and there is no strong blue colors. They have all shifted into teal. This is why you have this kind of, you know, really strong kind of... Um, the reason why you see like a, this kind of line here on teal is because these are the actual pixels that, you know, have been shifted from the blue and they have been moved more into the teal area. Okay, and this is this is also you can read. Look, you know, the green color would normally be here, like you know, on your scopes. Look, this is like a peak here. It's completely gone. It's not really there at all, right? Really interesting, right? And then you know, like uh, the same, you know, the reds are there, you know, and the and the, and the, and magenta's there. So what we basically really definitely cut is a blue and 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 green. Now, when we are doing these changes that are quite strong and drastic, and this is actually okay, guys. Don't be worried, you know, that, oh my God, what, I'm not going to have loose. Yeah, it's fine. Some looks just don't have this, you know. Some looks just 
are 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 like that you know and and you know it's it's absolutely normal you know sometimes you know you have looks that have, will have a you know very limited amount of you know certain color now don't forget don't forget that you can always actually control the intensity of your look and so decide how little or how much of that particular um, you know, effect do you want on your image? So you're, you're, you know, this is why you always see me like I don't want to have my show lot on timeline. I want to have my show lot on my node because I do like to have this control where I'm changing the intensity of the whole look and so deciding how much or how little of that particular, you know, kind of wrap of that particular feel that my show let is giving me I want. So this is really, really, you know, a useful feature. And why I always, you know, I always like to have a little blend, you know, like decide how much of that look do I want. What you're also looking for here is you want to make sure that there is no clipping. Okay, so what would happen is some of these colors would look a little bit flat. They would look like clipped, really, you know, like, you know, something, you know, they don't, they don't have the detail in them. And that's a no-no. That means, oh, my, 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 my show let's pushing something too much. So then you have to open that show let and control it and see where, which part of your lot is actually causing that. But, you know, we don't have that problem at all. You know, everything is seem to be, a, you, know, rep, you know, everything is passing through. It's limited, but it's not clipping anything, right? And then what the, la the last thing is the lightness. So we're going from very dark color to very bright color, right? So, or, or, you know, this is everything's black and then here everything's white, right? And, and, um, and so this is the darkest blue, this is the brightest blue, right? And the, again, you're going from, you know, magenta to magenta. And then here you're looking more on, on how are you controlling overall, uh, you know, kind of the, the, in the brightness of a color, right? The intensity of that. This is very um, normal behavior when we're doing uh, with film looks. The reason why is because, you know, film itself has got a great characteristic that colors are less kind of bright. You know, the colors are, are, are really, you know, um, showing its, its richness in the dark tones. It's just something, you know, how film is, you know, like if you, I always say to people, like, you know, if you ever want to, like, you know, just even, you know, uh, the simplest way to emulate that film look is just, you know, reduce the brightness of the color, not the saturation. Saturation is intensity, you know, you just reduce its brightness, right? And so you see, like, uh, this is this is very common, you know, to see that, you know, how basically it's it's moving its intensity more into the darker, into shadow area. And that's kind of where, where that beauty of, of filmic color is coming. Again, you're looking here, is there anything showing clipping, bending, or anything like that, right? So there could be, like, a, for example, you know, somehow, you know, like, you know, Nothing's really happening in my case, you know, right? I, can, I can't really see anything going wrong here. You know, you usually just try to see. Again, there would be like a patch sometimes would appear of something not looking very well, um, you know. And then again, you can always see what happens when you're blending things, you know, how, how much of that color and how much of this thing you're going to lose or not. And that's a really, really easy way, you know, for you to now analyze and say, okay, now I have my... my, my this particular, you know, look is actually really, you know, okay, or this show that is, is behaving in a good way. If it's not, what you do is then you just, for example, open your, 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 you know, but let me actually show you this, how you can do the same testing inside the DaVinci Resolve, you know, because the same thing, you know, it, you know, is available to you in a plugin as well. So actually, let me just make sure that this is a Panasonic camera. I don't think I changed that yet. So, but Panasonic, excellent. Uh, and then what you do is you go all the way to the bottom, right? And then here it starts like this, right? So first is tone map. So the same thing we have with the tone map. So I can then just quickly, you know, control here, bring my blue a little bit up. One second. Okay. One second, let me just see if I was to move it back. Uh -huh, this is enabled or disabled? Okay, enabled. Let me see if I do it a little bit with the printer lights. No, nothing's happening here. All right, one second. Okay, it's good. 
Okay, fine. The next thing then, um, um, what we can do is we can then also see the saturation ramp. So this is that same ramp we saw uh, inside the color lab. And then you have also lightness ramp. Same like inside the color lab. And you're really checking and looking, hey, is there anything distorted? Is there anything happening? Anything going wrong? Right. So these are absolutely the you know you know it, that that's kind of the same way of to how to test it in uh, in the look designer as a plugin as well. Um, okay. I was just wondering. Uh -huh, it's better now. Okay. Very nice. So I would I would definitely um, uh, I would definitely um, mm, how would I say uh, make sure that before you formalize this and export it as a lot, you do these tests, right? You really like, you know, make sure that there isn't anything going crazy. I want to show you like, for example, I know that, that there are some film stocks. I want to show you really what an error looks like, right? Um, so let me see. So this is my print. Uh, let me see if I was to do maybe like some old school stock because they, they are like a really like, you know, showing usually problem. Uh, classic let's do classic you know okay perfect and I'm gonna increase that okay now let's see now if I show my saturation ramp there oh it's looking pretty clean here actually saturation is looking nice my lightness ramp aha uh -huh, there we go look so this is what I mean so look all of this here right you see how it's kind of showing a little bit bending right that means uh-huh this particular this particular stock is you know having issue reproducing these particular colors so then what you do is then you say okay fine give me now my this is the, st the stock then you try to control the intensity of that stock you just bring it down a little bit until you don't see how you know how to how to uh, mitigate it a little bit so you see i'm just gonna go and 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 just, you know, bring it just a little bit down like this, you know, and then I say, aha, uh -huh, okay, so I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, I have that look, but I have, you know, reduced that kind of intensity of that particular look, because I don't want it to give me any distortion. Um, maybe it's not visible in this particular image, but maybe you're going to have a, like a clean shot of a sky and because it's a blue color it might show a little bit bending in that and you don't want this to happen you really want you know things to be reproduced really really clean so that would be like a an, an interesting way for you how to test you know the 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 image and, and how we call it a stress test it and just really you know do what's happening what i also do sometimes is i also sometimes just just basically you know switch this on and off as i'm building a look just to check you know see really what's happening you know where am i what's going on you know and, and especially like i I'm, I'm i'm always you know using a tone map you know because you know this is the first test that there is absolutely no difference in exposure or anything like that so yeah hope um this was interesting let me just go and check a little bit my chat um the the, the uh Oh, then, okay. Is it okay to pair Kodak Fuji? Of course, Mike. You want to pair everything. You want to really pair all possible. You know, the reason why <laughs> we have it is because you want to be creative, you know. And it actually wasn't unusual. Deakins used to do this all the time, you know, and, and, and you know, like a bland Fuji and, and Kodak, you know. They were, they was very, very common for cinematographers to do this. Um, that the will uh, will be able to do Ari log C in and out. Yes. Oh, that's a good question. We're gonna be able to do to do that, Vic Victor. We'll add a, with other log C as an out. No problem at all. Um, that the, every camera don't have a different middle gray value. That's true. That cameras don't have a different middle gray values. But you're not measuring the actual middle gray of the camera here. What you're measuring is the actual show lot, right? You are measuring that what goes inside your show lot and what comes outside of the show lot, it's the same. And your show lot in its design space is using 400. And it doesn't matter what your camera is going to be sending in and out. You're just measuring what comes inside the show lot and outside of the show lot. That's the value that we are measuring, okay? And that's why we are sticking to 400 because internally we use everything for log C and this is all uh, internally 
in a 400. Question, any plans to add the different features such as halation and gateway we look designer? Yes, they are. The first thing we actually we're building um, is, um, is uh, um, the, um, uh, what's it called, uh, grain lab, you know, so we just have a, like a, the three dimensional grain coming. Now look, I have a like a halation, you know, effect that I build, but it's it's to me it's nothing really like much better than what you can do with nodes inside the DaVinci Resolve. The only time I really want to release a plugin and, and put something into a plugin is if I can make it better than you know what you know I can do with nodes, right? If that, if I if that if I there is a limitation to what, how far I can do stuff inside you know, DaVinci, then I would do it. And so far, you know, I have to tell you that, you know, a lot, of, you know, yes, the, it's really possible, you know, to, to do halation really well and nicely inside DaVinci. And, uh, and, and you don't really need plugin for that, right? It's not really something that, you know, you, you desperately need a plugin. Now, sure, you know, when, when we come to a point that we feel like, okay, we have a better quality than, than the nodes, then we're going to add it. And um, and especially when this is also going to be real time, you know, there are plugins out there that promise you all these effects, and you put it on, and then you have to render. And for me, this is also like, well, why am I rendering this with a plugin when I can get the same effect in real time in my nodes as well? So you have to like also, you know, understand that that, that, that you know there is pros and cons, you know, for anything. Um, and you know, as well, you know, when we make an, a plugin, especially Look Designer, because it's used in all these big facilities, they run Linux, so we have to, like, you know, really make sure that it works on all operating systems. You get me? It's, so all of these effects are are, are a little bit challenging. Um, Levente asked a question: uh, How would uh, you be your approach grading a feature? You design a look first, and then uh, correct exposure and white balance. That's correct. I always design a look first, and then I apply that as a show lot, and then I work on my on my nodes underneath to basically bring everything into like a balance. That's exactly Levente how I work. Joao asked a question, are CDL values from ColorLab carried over in X01? If not, how can I export them to DaVinci Resolve? Oh, very easy. So basically, look, you just come here and you just say, hey, uh, push this shot to Resolve, right? You just say that. And then, uh, you know, it's gonna basically push it now to Resolve. And I think I might even have a, like a node tree attached if I don't. Look, so basically it 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 pushed all of this, right? As an IDT, you know, this is you know the first one. This is the CDL, you know, that I created earlier. This is the show lat, you know, and this is the ODT, right? So what you can do effectively, you can say, well, you know what, guys, I am going to now uh, replace this node and this node with my uh, with this look designer that I've just created earlier. Copy and then paste. So now basically I have just replaced my show LUT as a LUT um, with the look designer node which is then parametric and then I have all the CDLs like this. Okay. That's actually a workflow I tend to do at the moment. You know what I do is I basically go and 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 balance everything inside the color lab because it's much quicker for balancing. And then I push that, and then I use um, the um, uh, and I replace the look with a look designer plugin that I have it as a parametric. So that's a really like a good way of how to do it. Uh, uh, on my Mac Air color lab uh, uh, color lab don't work oh, hey. yeah so maybe it's not quite powerful to that level yeah i'm so sorry to hear that you need a little power for ai so i have to say uh, 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 uh yes that's right edgar it's the halation and all these effects you know when you use them as a node it's it's much 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 better like that okay all right so guys um hopefully you enjoyed this and i really want to thank you for tuning in to another ama um i let me know like always in your questions uh, what else you'd like me to show you uh, and you know what other stuff you'd like to learn um i am going to be tuning in again on thursday in a week time so until then i want to wish you 
have a great time and don't forget um, we have this great course with Walter Volpato next Saturday and the Saturday after that so first he's going to be grading a feature and then he's going to be grading a commercial completely different workflows so it's really important to see both you know how to work when you're working on film a lot of shots and how to work when you're working with commercials right thank you so much guys enjoy your day see you soon and bye bye